hello and welcome to NPTEL MOOC on Applied Electromagnetics for Engineers. We will continue the discussion of calculating magnetostatic fields uh, for a few more cases because this is quite important. The next example that we are going to consider is the field of a coaxial cable. Now, a coaxial cable is a very important transmission line as we have seen earlier and this has a structure that looks like this. So, there is a central conductor of some radius A and surrounded by this central conductor. The central conductor actually carries a current of I, whereas the return current is carried by the outer conductor and the outer conductor has a certain thickness of C minus B because I am assuming that the outer conductor is again given by two conducting circles, one having a radius B and the other having a radius of C. So, the thickness of the outer conductor is C minus B. We will assume that this current is uniformly distributed in the entire cross section. So, what we mean by that is that the current density J will be equal to I which is the current being carried divided by pi A square for the inner conductor because this is the inner conductor having a radius of A and therefore, an area of pi A square the current density is always given by the current divided by the area. So, this is I by pi A square. Okay. Now, my goal is to determine the magnetic field for all values of R. First, I will consider the case where this value of R okay, will be within the inner conductor. That is, I am going to consider this particular loop or this one in the longitudinal cross section, which is at a radial distance of small r. Okay. Now, notice that because this r is within inner conductor, the limit of r is that this r can be 0 to a, that is it can go from 0 to a. What is the amount of current being carried by this particular cross section? So, if you now look at just the inner conductor, this radius is a, but then I am considering this particular cross section which is given by this one. So, this is just the inner conductor. I know that from the entire the area or the entire inner conductor cross section, the current density will be I by pi A square and the current that comes out will be I by pi A square. So, you can again go back to this example. This is the inner conductor, the current coming out uniform and has a current density of I by pi A square. Whereas, I am interested only in the current through this particular radius R or the cross section of radius R. How much current do I actually get? Well, you can easily see that if this is the current density, then the current that is coming out of this you know cross section let us say S 1, okay, I through S 1 will be equal to current density times whatever the area of the cross section S 1 and that cross section area is pi r square. right? Therefore, this would be given by I r square by A square as the total current that is coming out from the cross section S 1, where R can go from 0 to A. Okay. Now, this is the right hand side for our Ampere's law. What about the left hand side of the Ampere law? Well, we have in the previous module seen that if I have a wire you know carrying a cross section or if this is a conductor, then the magnetic field will be circulating this particular wire. right? So, the magnetic field will be along the phi direction. Only thing that you now have to understand is that you are considering within the inner conductor the radial distance r, but on that radial distance r the value of h will be constant, h will of course be along the phi direction, but the corresponding line integration will be equal to 2 pi r. This will be equal to the current coming out from the cross section S 1. So, this would be i r square by a square. Clearly, r on this side cancels out with r on the other side and h phi is given by i by 2 pi a square into r. Okay. And for future reference, we will also write b phi. b phi is given by mu naught i r by 2 pi a square. And if I sketch this b phi, how does b phi look as a function of r? Well, at r equal to 0, the magnetic field will be 0 because there is no cross section out there. So, there is no scope of having some current coming out. So, this is 0, but at r equal to a, it reaches a maximum value of mu 0 i divided by 2 pi a. So, it increases linearly and reaches a value of mu naught i divided by 2 pi a at r equal to a. Beyond that what happens? We will have to calculate that now. When I consider the radius r to be outside the inner conductor, but within the outer conductor, 
So, this is my new value of r now. I know that the total current enclosed by this cross section which we will call as cross section S2 will be equal to I itself, correct? Because the entire inner conductor is now contributing to the current. So, when R is between A to B, the total current enclosed of the cross section S2 will be equal to the current of the inner conductor I. Okay? The left hand side does not really change, so you still have H phi 2 pi R that must be equal to I and H phi is given by I by 2 pi R. Okay? Now, you see that the magnetic field is actually inversely falling off with respect to R. For future reference again B phi will be equal to mu naught I by 2 pi R. So, at R equal to A you will have B phi of mu 0 I by 2 pi A therefore, there is a nice continuity out there. So, this was mu 0 I by 2 pi A and from there onwards it actually starts to fall off. When you go to B right it falls off inversely I have not drawn it very nicely, but when you go to B the value will be mu naught I by 2 pi into B okay? that is the value for B phi. Now, we are we have only one more cross section to consider okay? and that cross section happens to be within B, but less than C. So, this is the cross section that I am going to consider or this is the radial distance that I am going to consider. The corresponding cross section we will call this as S3. So, this inner radius is A, this is B and this outside conductor radius is C. Okay? Now, what is the current density? Now, this one actually has two components. One, there is a current contribution from the inner conductor because now that you are in the outside, there is a contribution of the current I and the total current enclosed will be equal to I. However, the current enclosed over this cross section will have, you know, in addition to the inner current, there will also be a contribution from the current being carried by the outer conductor. So, part of the outer conductor current will also be present here. Okay? And what is that part of the outer current? Well, first we calculate what is the outer conduction current density is J equal to I minus I divided by pi C square minus B square. Why is there a minus I sign, I mean minus sign to the current? Well, because this is the return current that we are considering. So, on the inner conductor the current is I whereas on the outer conductor the current is minus I. Therefore, this is the current density that you are going to get. But what is the cross sectional area of this hatched thing that we have talked about? right? So, in this hatched cross section that is the cross sectional area is given by pi R square minus B square. Therefore, the total current enclosed from the cross section S3 will be the inner current or the current contributed by the inner conductor minus whatever the current that is contributed actually plus, but in this case I is minus therefore, you get I R square minus B square divided by C square minus B square. Okay? This is the current, of course, this current must be equal to then 2 pi R where again R is the radial distance of corresponding to the cross section S3 that we are considering times H phi. So, H phi will be equal to I divided by 2 pi R which is the contribution from the inner conductor minus I R square minus B square. So, I by C square minus B square well there is also 2 pi over there and then you have divided by R. Okay? It is a little complicated expression, but if you now look at what happens to H phi at C that is at R equal to C you will see that this would be C square minus B square that would cancel out here which would again cancel out with I by 2 pi R and you will actually get this value equal to 0. So, H phi will change in some manner which I not plotting, but when you go to C the magnetic field will be equal to 0 because if you go to any region outside, right? so if you go to any region outside clearly the total current contributed will be equal to the plus current I by the inner conductor and the return current of the outer conductor which is minus I. Therefore, there is no current enclosed if you go to a cross section S4 which is at a radial distance R greater than C. So, for R greater than C no field. In fact, this is one of the reasons why there is such a nice thing about coaxial cable because all the fields are confined only within the structure itself. There are no fields on the outside. This is all true as long as you have a perfect coaxial conductor, but unfortunately in real world you do not have a perfect coaxial conductor. Therefore, there will be some amount of magnetic field present outside some amount of electric field will also be present outside. In order to protect you know the cable from all these external ones, you actually jacket this coaxial cable. So, a coaxial cable will have an inner conductor, outer conductor and a jacket. The medium in between will be filled by some dielectric or an insulating medium. Okay? 
This completes our calculation of magnetostatic fields using Ampere's law or Biot-Savart's law. The previous problem can also be solved by Biot-Savart's law. It is little more difficult uh, compared to the Ampere's law, so I would not suggest you do that one. Wherever possible, take advantage of symmetry. Wherever possible, take advantage of Ampere's law. But even these Ampere law and you know the uh, Biot-Savart's law kind of are very difficult to handle when the situation goes slightly difficult. What do I mean by difficult scenario? Here is an example. Suppose I consider you know uh, current, but not in the form of a wire, but in the form of a loop. Okay, and I put this current carrying loop in z equal to zero plane. That is, I actually consider the current in the z equal to zero plane. Of course, this is the y-axis. This is the x-axis. You have to pardon the way I have drawn this one. Let us say the radius of this wire is a. And I want the field to be calculated at this point P, which will be 0, y, comma z. Why am I taking this as 0, y and z? With a little bit of convincing yourself, you can see that because of symmetry, it is just sufficient for us to calculate the field at any constant value of x. And what better value of constant of x than x equal to 0 to simplify our calculations a little bit. So, I want the field P here. Now, Ampere's law is very difficult to apply in this case. Biot Savart's law is even more difficult to apply in this case. Therefore, we need some other means of calculating the magnetic field, and it is here that we introduce another quantity called as a vector potential A. What is the vector potential? We know del cross H is given by J vector, okay? but del dot B is always equal to 0. Now, when del dot B is 0, I can write this B as a curl of some other vector. Okay? And this some other vector A is called as the vector potential A or the magnetic vector potential A. Why is this true? Because del dot del cross A will always be equal to 0. Therefore, if I write the B field in terms of another field called A, okay, which is called as the vector potential, then first I calculate the potential A, which will be reasonably simple to calculate, reasonably, I am not saying that it will always be, but reasonably simple. From there, we go back and infer what is the value of B. Okay. How do I relate all these things? So, of course, since B is mu H, H will be del cross A by mu, but you do not really need to worry about that. Now, consider what happens to del cross del cross A. Right? That is, I know what is del cross A, which is B, and I take the curl of this B itself. So, I get del cross del cross A, and one of the vector identities is that this is del of del dot A minus del square A. And we are at complete liberty to specify what is this del dot A. We specify the simplest case of del dot A equal to 0. This incidentally is called as the Coulomb gauge, okay? gauge being simple meter kind of a thing. And del cross A is nothing but B, B is nothing but mu into H in general, mu is constant we are considering in this particular case. So, what I have is del cross H I know which is J. And this right hand side is minus del square A. Therefore, del square A vector is equal to minus mu j. If you look at this equation, this equation should remind you of Poisson's equation. So, you had del square V equal to minus rho by epsilon. Only thing is that this V was a scalar in that particular case. Here, this vector A is a vector of course. Okay. However, for each component of A, you can simplify the equation to make it look like the Poisson's equation type and we know the solution for this Poisson equation. right? So, V at any point R is given by integral of rho dV prime, which was the volume distribution divided by 4 pi epsilon R minus R prime right? magnitude. In a similar way, you can write A at any point R as the integral over the volume distribution of the current. So, instead of 1 by epsilon, you will now have mu. So, mu j at the field point, sorry, at the source point R prime integrated over the volume integral divided by 4 pi R, where R is the magnitude of R minus R prime vector. Why is this vector potential and uh, you know uh, easier method than biot savart's law? Well, one important thing is that if j is varying in a particular direction, the magnetic vector potential will also vary in the same direction or it will have the same direction as j vector. Whereas, the B field will have a direction that should be perpendicular to this j as well as the point which connects from the source to the 
point where you are evaluating the field. So, that cross product is kind of eliminated now that, that is eliminated of course, in the form of the vector potential calculation. Then the cross product makes its re-entry when you calculate B in terms of del cross A. However, if I know A which is reasonably simple to calculate than B, okay, reasonably not extremely easy. So, if I calculate A, you know, which will have the same direction of J, then follow it up by calculating the curl, then this is an easier procedure. Okay. And we can also show that the calculation of vector potential in many cases, especially in antennas is more straightforward okay, than calculating the B field. So, whatever that we are developing will actually be very, very useful when we discuss antennas. So, let us go back to that loop that we were considering at this point I am going to calculate the vector potential correct. So, let us say first I need to write down the position vector of uh, this one of the point uh, which we will call as O of the point P which is the line O P. So, let us label this position vector as R. I know that this is in the spherical coordinates along the radial direction and we will now assume that there is a current distribution which I am looking at. So, this is the current distribution that I am looking at which will be along the phi direction right. So, it would be I d phi prime where phi is the angle that this is making. So, this is the angle phi. So, from the x axis whatever the angle that this line O q makes q being the current element. Okay. So, this would be O q, but I am not interested in O q or O p. What I am interested is actually in this uh, vector r okay, which is the vector from the source point to the field point. Okay. For our own sake we already know that this uh, angle from the z axis to the point p will always be or the radial vector will be equal to theta and we will call the angle between o p and o q by alpha and in general this alpha plus theta will not be equal to pi by 2. What is this? Why is it not equal to pi by 2? Let us go back to this kind of a simple picture over here. Okay. So, I have this picture, this is my z axis. Okay. So, this is the z axis, this is the loop, this is the current that I am considering. Now, imagine that I have, you know, I am considering the current and I am evaluating the field at the tip of my index finger. Okay. What is the angle? So, this, this point you can consider this as the origin. So, if I had one more finger, I could have pointed it like this and you know or pointed like this and then shown you that the angle made by this vector which is from the origin to this one is the angle theta. Okay. Whereas, this particular line is the capital R vector okay, that angle between that one and the position vector. Okay. So, this is the position vector. So, the angle between these two. So, you can see this particular angle right. So, shown by my left hand thumb this angle is alpha unless I am actually on the y axis at which point you know this alpha will be in such a way that this angle alpha plus the angle theta will be equal to pi by 2 in general they are not. Okay. So, in general alpha and this one are not in the same direction. However, I can draw a projection, okay. I can project this p onto the y axis and this amount of projection that you are going to get let us call this as some p prime. So, O p prime is certainly equal to r sin theta where r is the magnitude of the vector O p. Okay. So, this O p prime is r sin theta, but if I now further project, so this is the unit vector let us say along the O q. So, if I further project O p prime onto O q line, okay, that is the O q line is this one. So, if I further project it onto this one, the corresponding projection that I am going to obtain will be whatever the magnitude of O p prime which would be r sin theta times this angle. Okay this angle is now in the exit plane given by 90 minus phi. Therefore, this would be cos of 90 minus phi the magnitude of vector O p prime the magnitude of the unit vector O q which will be equal to 1. The angle between O q and O p prime O p prime is on the y axis. So, this cos of 90 minus phi cos of this angle times this one will be equal to r sin theta sorry this is sin phi. Why is it sin phi? Because cos of 90 minus phi is what you are looking at. So, cos 90 minus phi is cos 90 cos phi plus sin 90 sin phi and we know that this quantity is 0. So, this is sin phi. Okay. So, this is actually important for us to note later on. Okay. We will come back to that expression. First, write down what is A here. A at point P 
is given by mu naught i a divided by 4 pi these are the constants which I am pulling out of the integral. So, this is because I am assuming this one is mu naught and the current is now not in terms of j, but it is in terms of i d l prime because I am considering the filamentary current there is no integration over the volume the integration is over only the line and then we have already seen that this i d l prime is equal to i a d phi prime where a d phi is equal to d l. So, multiplying it by i I get this one. Okay. So, I can write this mu 0 i a by 4 pi and then I have onto this particular expression which is a d phi prime divided by capital R where R is the distance that we have already talked about. And what is the direction for this a? The direction for a is actually the direction of the current which is along the phi axis, but unit vector phi can be written in terms of x and y coordinates as phi equal to minus sin phi into x hat minus sin phi prime because I have to represent this one as not phi, but phi prime or we will simply represent this as phi itself kind of simplifies our I you know uh, this one. So, this would be minus sin phi x hat plus cos phi y hat. Okay. So, I know that conversion from the vector phi in the cylindrical coordinates or in the spherical coordinates onto the x and y coordinates. Okay. Now, here is an important point let us go back to this loop. Okay. There was one current element along this d phi prime located at point q. If I consider symmetric point okay, about y, this is not a nice symmetric point, but if I consider symmetric point about y, there will be a current element going in this way, correct. Let us call this point as some q prime point and what is the direction of the current element along this q prime point that would be along the phi direction. But if you now look at the two lines that we have or the two contributions of this q and q prime current elements, one will be in this direction, the other one will be along this direction. Okay. And what is the resultant of these two? The resultant will be along this direction which happens to be along minus x direction. Okay. So, the resultant field is only along the minus x direction and therefore, we do not have to worry about the y component of the field because the field will be along the minus x hat direction. Okay. So, I can go back and write this a as mu naught i small a is a constant. So, I can pull that out divided by 4 pi. I still have an integral of d phi prime okay, and minus sin phi and this was along the phi hat direction divided by r. Okay. But at point p x is equal to 0. right? So, when x is equal to 0, the corresponding vector phi you know unit vector phi hat will be equal to minus x hat. Therefore, I can substitute for x hat equal to minus phi hat in this expression replace the minus sign with the plus sign. Okay. So, now I have the potential a written on this one. From this triangle which is p o q where the angle between o p and o q is alpha. Uh, I can write down from the law of cosines, you have to remember your uh, geometry for this one. I can write down the law from the law of cosines as r equal to square root of r square plus a square minus 2 a r cos alpha. Okay. And r cos alpha is actually a projection of r onto the line. right? So, this r cos alpha in fact should be equal to r sin theta, r cos alpha is a projection of this vector r or the vector o p onto the line o q and this projection of o p onto the line o q is precisely what we calculated by first projecting o p onto o p prime and then projecting o p prime onto q which gave us r sin theta sin phi. Therefore, this r cos alpha will be equal to r sin theta sin phi. Okay. So, you can substitute for that one and instead of cos alpha you can write this cos alpha as sin theta sin phi. Okay. So, what happens to a? We, uh, a will be along the phi direction. So, we now know that a is along the phi direction at the point p and this would be given by mu naught a i is a constant divided by 4 pi r integral 0 to 2 pi sin phi d phi. Remember this was in the numerator. In the denominator I have uh, r square plus a square minus 2 a r sin theta sin phi. Okay, under root. This in general is very difficult to evaluate, but we make an assumption that r is much larger than a that is we are at a very very far away distance from the loop and in that limit 
I can simplify this expression, I can remove a square and I can simplify this expression by removing r square outside the square root and I can rewrite this as mu 0 a i by 4 pi r square okay, because r came out and integral 0 to 2 pi sin phi d phi divided by 1 minus a by r sin theta sin phi 2 a, a by r sin theta sin phi under root. But if I know that 1 plus square root of from binomial theorem the square root of 1 plus x is approximately 1 plus x by 2. Therefore, if I remove the square root then this would be uh, this 2 will go away because there will be a division by 2 there. So, it would be 1 minus a by r sin theta sin phi. I also know that 1 by 1 minus x is approximately 1 plus x okay, when x is very small and in this case it is small. So, I can write a phi as mu naught i okay, sin theta a square divided by 4 pi r square or oh, there will be a pi here. Okay. So, I or I can write this as mu naught i pi a square which is the area of the loop times sin theta divided by 4 pi r square. You can now apply del cross a to calculate b and if you do that you will see this can be written as mu naught i pi a square divided by 4 pi r cube. You have to actually carry out this I will leave it as an exercise for you. So, times 2 cos theta r hat plus sin theta along theta hat. So, this expression for magnetic field is a very important expression or the expression for the vector potential is very important when we discuss loop antennas at the end of the course. I know I have left a few steps as exercises for you. This problem is slightly difficult, but I wanted you to understand, I want you to understand this problem how to solve it because these results are very useful for our uh, antenna analysis. And if you look at the magnetic vector potential B that you have calculated and you go back and calculate the electric field of a dipole in the far away region, the fields will actually be identical except for the constant factor. So, the field configuration of an electric dipole which is just a short you know two charges separated plus q and minus q by a certain distance is exactly equal to a dipole which is a small loop okay, and at a very far away distance the field configurations are equal to each other. Therefore, many loop antennas can be analyzed by the equivalent electric field analysis of the dipole analysis I mean of the dipoles. With this we stop at this module. Thank you very much.